I've been using the A10 Mini Extreme for a few months now and I've clocked in hundreds of hours of use of it. In this video, I'm gonna tell you all of my favorite things and all of my least favorite things about the A10 Mini Extreme. Hi, I'm Aaron Parecki. So before we get started, I do wanna give a quick disclosure here. As soon as the A10 Mini Extreme launched, I pre-ordered one from DVE Store. The one I've been using primarily is the one I bought, but Blackmagic did also send me one out on loan. Blackmagic also loaned me the camera I'm recording this on, the Pocket 6K Pro. But Blackmagic doesn't get any input into what I say, and they don't get to watch this video before I post it. Everything in this video is my own honest opinion, and I'm really just trying to help you make an informed decision about your purchases. So buckle up, this is gonna be a long video. Let's get started. So first, I wanna talk a little bit about what I've been using the A10 Mini Extreme for. Since I've been in the studio for the last year now, without really going outside, most of my use of it has been in a studio environment. I've used it for the weekly live streams on this channel. I've also run other live streams for other people on their channels using the Extreme. I've taught hundreds of hours of workshops in my software development job using the A10 Mini Extreme. I've also designed a stand to put the A10 Mini Extreme on for use on my desk. This stand is really meant for desktop use. It's meant to get the A10 Mini Extreme off of the table, make the ports more accessible, and to be able to attach things to the top and sides. So the A10 Mini Extreme is really like the A10 Mini, but bigger. It can do more of everything. It's got more inputs and it's got more processing power. First, I'm gonna talk about things that I absolutely love about the A10 Mini Extreme. Starting with the eight inputs. There are eight HDMI inputs on this, and that means you can just connect so many more things to this. The original A10 Mini had four inputs, which is great, but I found myself filling those up pretty quick, especially once I started adding graphics into the show. With eight inputs, I don't really feel constrained anymore. I feel like I have enough inputs to run whatever I need to for a show. And it means that if you are doing key fill graphics so that you can do graphics with proper transparency, that takes up two of your inputs. That still leaves you six, whereas on the original A10 Mini, it would have taken up half of them. Okay, but by far my favorite new feature in this is the super source. If you're not familiar with SuperSource, that's what lets you do the side-by-side -side or split view or four up layouts in the device itself. Previously, this feature was limited to the very high end ATEM switchers, and it is now available in the ATEM Mini Extreme at just $1,000. Frankly, I never expected to see that feature added to this tier of product. I thought that was always going to be reserved for the higher end models. So this is a feature that lets you do layouts like a person on the side and a computer scaled down or an iPad, or it lets you do things like four speakers lined up in a row, cropped with an animated background. This feature opens up a ton of possibilities for using this device. And if you're using it along with an application like Mix Effect, then you can even animate the transitions between different super source layouts. Okay, the next super cool feature in this, which is not new in the extreme, it's macros. I do still use macros quite a lot in this device. I'm definitely a lot less reliant on it now that there are just a lot more features in it and more inputs. I found that I've actually not needed nearly as many macros as I did on the original A10 Mini because there are just multiple upstream keys and multiple downstream keys available and I don't have to swap things out in order to reposition windows. So continuing the theme of just more of everything available, there are now two USB ports on the back. I'm super glad for this because it just makes things so much easier to deal with. One of the USB ports is just always plugged into my computer so that the webcam is always available. And the other one is now available for recording to a hard drive. So I can just leave a hard drive plugged in and leave it plugged into my computer to record my webinars as well as be in Zoom. I wish they had put the two USB ports on the original A10 minis, but it's great to see this in the extreme. And more of everything means more downstream keys. The original A10 mini has one downstream key, which is what lets you do one overlay on top of the video. You can use it for a corner graphic or you can do chat overlay with it. But now in the extreme, there are two. Doesn't sound like much, but it actually means there's a lot more flexibility. You can dedicate one downstream key to your chat overlay. You can dedicate one to the corner logo. And it means you don't have to swap things out and you can just leave things on the screen all the time. One of the really impressive things is how many new upstream keyers there are. Again, the original A10 Mini has one upstream key. That's the one that lets you do chroma keying or luma keying of sources, as well as scaling windows. On the extreme, there are four. That means you can take four inputs and chroma key all of them. So what I end up doing is I end up dedicating specific tasks to each upstream keyer. One of them will do the luma key for the countdown timer in the corner. One of them might be doing a chroma key. And I don't have to worry about changing settings. I can just turn things on and off as I need them. And again, more of everything. Now there's two media players. 
You can load 20 graphics into the media pool, and then now two of them can be available at the same time. So again, that means you can have one as just a title screen that you can always fall back to. The other can be your graphic for the corner bug, and you don't need to swap them around using macros anymore. You can just have all the graphics loaded up. And there are two HDMI outputs. And again, this is super, super handy. I dedicate one of the HDMI outputs to multi-view, and that means I can just always have that available. And the other one, I can then switch depending on what I'm doing. So if I'm running somebody else's live stream, I will usually send the program feed back out to the other HDMI into a confidence monitor for them to see what the program looks like. But if I'm running my own webinar, I may not need the confidence monitor, so I might take that HDMI out and run a clean feed into a recorder or run a second monitor from my computer into the ATEM and then pass it through onto a screen next to me. There's just a lot more flexibility with the two HDMIs. Now you can do a lot of these things with the original ATEM Mini Pro because it is, again, quite a capable device, but I do feel like I'm always working around the limits of the Pro when I'm using it. With the original ATEM Mini Pro, I was finding I was running up against the limits pretty often. So I would actually usually run a second ATEM next to it just to add three more inputs. And I would have to create a lot of macros in order to do things on the fly, like switch from picture in picture to a side by side layout. The ATEM Mini Extreme does so much now, and it just does it without me thinking about it. That I often take it for granted. The other day, I just found myself being like, oh yeah, this thing does a lot. And I kind of don't fight it anymore. It's just there and it just works really well. So these are the things that I really like about it and why it has a permanent home on my desk. But I do want to talk a little bit about things that I'm not as much of a fan of, starting with features I just don't use. Now, again, as I'm describing these things, keep in mind my use case is primarily using it in this studio in a fixed position. And the vast majority of my use is filming myself either in live streams or webinars. So as I describe these features I don't use, it's not that they're bad, it's just that I don't have a use for them in my use case. So the first in this list is the Blackmagic camera control. Now I do have a Blackmagic Pocket 4K camera, and it's what I usually use for filming it myself at this table. However, because I'm in a fixed position and I have control over the lighting in the studio, I never need to change the settings. I set all the settings in the camera manually and I just leave it. I don't need the camera control from the ATEM because I don't need to make adjustments on the fly. Now again, that's just my use case here. If I were using this remotely, of course that would be a very useful feature. I just don't find myself using it at all. Let's talk about the buttons. There are a lot of buttons on this thing, like a lot, a lot. And again, I don't use the vast majority of them. In fact, I use only a few buttons. The buttons I do use are the camera control buttons as well as the media player and the super source, because that's a quick way to switch between camera angles. I do find myself using the streaming on off button as well as the record on off. And I actually really like the HDMI output selection buttons. That way I can quickly go from the multi view to previewing one source full screen. If those were the only buttons on the device, I would actually be totally happy. Most of the time I'm actually controlling the device over the network using Stream Deck and Companion because that lets me do a lot more things that there aren't buttons for. Whether that's running macros or loading in specific graphics into the media players or doing carefully timed things like switching cameras and switching audio sources in sync. There's a limit to what you can do with the buttons even though there's just so many of them. Some of the buttons that I've literally never touched, the camera control buttons, 100%. I, again, just don't really have a reason to control the cameras remotely. I also never touch the top row source select buttons. I do all of that kind of control through the macros. Also the transition buttons, just like on the original A10 mini, I don't change these settings, certainly not enough to justify a button for them. There are some buttons that I actually would like to see that don't exist though. And that's actually giving me full control over each of the upstream and downstream keys. There's the key on off button, but it's only for one of the downstream keys. And for the same with the upstream key. I actually would like on off buttons for all four upstream keys and both downstream keys. That could actually be really useful. So anyway, this is one of the reasons that I've always said that buttons should be reprogrammable because people have different use cases and you probably have different use cases of different buttons that you want to press compared to me. Okay, the last feature that I don't really use, even though I think it's a really cool feature, is the USB tethering. And that's because I don't take this anywhere. It's connected over ethernet on my desk. I don't need to tether a phone even though that is a super, super cool feature. But that kind of actually leads me to the next point, which is the size. I don't think this is mini anymore. I think we've broken past the point of this being called a mini. This is a large device. It's almost a full rack size, and it's larger than a 16-inch laptop. 
it's actually too wide to fit in a 16 inch laptop case. And it's so big that I actually have to get like a special backpack in order to carry it around. And I don't think that really counts as mini anymore. The original A10 mini and pro and ISO, those are a great size, super small. You can throw that in a bag and not really think about it. This one, you actually have to plan around. And that's why I think the USB tethering is actually a lot more useful on the smaller ones, because those I am more likely to take to a gig because they are just a lot easier to carry around. Okay, so these are the things that I just don't use. Now I wanna talk about some of the actual problems I've had with the device. Okay, first of all, this one's kind of weird. And I'm not actually sure exactly where the problem is. The way I use mine is I've actually got most of my sources connected over SDI. And I've got a bunch of Blackmagic SDI to HDMI converters. And I can switch which SDI sources are connected to each input electronically. And that lets me do things like rewire my studio virtually or remotely. And it's super handy to be able to do that. Today I can say input five is my overhead camera and then I can just press a button and now it's suddenly a second computer monitor. That's super cool that it does that. But what's really annoying is that sometimes when a source switches or comes online for the first time, the HDMI video is offset and there's a little black bar. And you've probably noticed that in some of my live streams because I've either done a switch live and didn't notice or just forgot to check before I started. One of the other reasons this happens is if my computer goes to sleep and then I wake up the monitors, sometimes when it wakes up and starts sending a video signal, it loses that horizontal sync. I don't know if this is the fault of the ATEM Mini Extreme or if it's the SDI to HDMI converter. But in any case, both are Blackmagic devices, so it should just work. In order to fix it, all I have to do is unplug the HDMI and plug it back in, and then it resyncs up and it's aligned perfectly. So it's annoying, but it's not a deal breaker. One of the other problems I've had with it is after it's left on for several days, sometimes the webcam output gets really slow. And to fix that one, I just have to unplug the webcam and plug it back in. Worst case, reboot the whole device, but usually just unplugging the USB fixes it. I'm usually using this with my M1 Mac Mini, so maybe it's a compatibility issue with that in particular. I'm not totally sure, but that is a problem I've had with it. One of the other problems, which I know a lot of people are complaining about, and I don't actually mind it that much, but the USB output colors are definitely more contrasty than the HDMI colors. So if you have a lot of details in the shadow or details in the highlights, it can definitely look washed out. This usually isn't a problem if your image is well exposed because most of the information will be in the middle range and it doesn't change that much. But if you're trying to share graphics from a computer, slides with light text, that can either get totally washed out or be crushed in the blacks. It is very annoying that the colors don't match and I wish Blackmagic would fix it, but in practice, it doesn't end up being that bad for actually how I end up using it anyway. But that's really the only problems I've had with it. Most of my experience with this has been excellent. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about about the Extreme is the price. The Extreme is $1,000 and the Extreme ISO is $1,300. This is no longer a cheap device. It is definitely affordable for what it gives you. In fact, it's an incredible deal for the features that it gives you. But it's not so cheap that I would just say absolutely go out and buy one the same way I did with the original A10 Mini. So at $1,000, it's something to consider, but it is by far the cheapest way to get SuperSource, which lets you do the side-by-side -side or four-up layout. The ISO model at $1,300 is by far the cheapest way to record eight HDMI sources in parallel. You cannot find a recorder that can record eight, and buying eight individual recorders will cost you more than this, so it is a great deal if you need it for that. Keep in mind the recordings are H.264 encoded. They're about 70 megabits. So they're not ProRes or anything like that, but they are good enough to edit and remix for YouTube videos. So for what this can do, it is an incredibly good price. And if you have even the slightest thought that you want the ISO recording feature, definitely do save up the extra $300 and spend it on the ISO model because there is no way to get that feature any cheaper anywhere else. So those are the things that I like and don't like about the ATM Mini Extreme. Now I want to talk a little bit about what I would like to see in the next ATEM device. First, let's start with the obvious one. The ATEM Mini Extreme can do an awful lot. It's got a ton of amazing features. We don't really need the buttons. So let's put it into a rack mount and shove it in a rack case. I don't even think we need the row of buttons on the front like the TV studio. I know plenty of people who have the Extreme and they tuck it in a case and never touch it, only controlling it over the network. That would also be perfect for remote studio workflows where you just have that tucked away in the remote studio and you do all of your control remotely. I don't know how much money it would save removing the buttons, but I do know that being able to put it into a rack would be very useful. 
I do suspect we're going to see something like that pretty soon because that mid-tier rack mount lineup right now is definitely due for an update. But I also want to talk about something that maybe you didn't expect. And that is, I actually want to see something smaller than the ATEM Mini. Let's call it the ATEM Nano. This would be like a trimmed down ATEM Mini for only the use cases that you need just two inputs. Think of this as like half the size of an ATEM Mini. There would be two HDMI inputs. You'd still have a media pool. You'd still have one upstream key and one downstream key. It would have an HDMI out, still your USB webcam, and then maybe let's throw the RTMP encoder in there too. So why do I want this? Well, if you actually look at a lot of what people are using the ATEM Mini for, they actually don't need all four inputs. There's a lot of use cases that are only using the ATEM Mini to be able to remote control Blackmagic camera, or to be able to push one video feed over RTMP into a streaming bridge. There's a lot of cool things you can do, even if you only have two HDMI sources. Think about virtual sets. You need to composite one video feed with a background. It could be a static graphic, or it could be a moving background generated from a 3D set software. Being able to composite a video feed over a background means you could put that on the camera and then send the composited feed back to the main switcher. Another use for this tiny switcher would be for running projectors. You want to be able to switch between the speaker's laptop as well as maybe a rolling deck of credits or just a static graphic. And you want that as close to the projector as you can to avoid running long HDMI cables. And then you could control that over the network. I've done things like that at conferences before, either using an ATEM Mini or using other switchers that were more expensive than the ATEM Mini. Having just a two input switcher would actually be super cool for that. You could also use it for just when you want a single picture in picture, just computer slides with a picture in the corner, or if the device did have super source in it, because apparently you can just add that to these things now, it could even do a side-by-side -side layout, which would be pretty cool. There's also the whole remote contribution workflows. We've seen plenty of events now buy fleets of ATEM minis and then use only one input on them. It seems like just a waste to have three sitting there. So the only way this would work is if the price was less than the ATEM mini, which is still $300. But even if it's only like $100 less, I think it would still be absolutely worth it. And to be clear, this device does not need that many buttons at all. Maybe the only buttons are just input one, input two, and the media pool. At let's say $200, I would absolutely buy several of those because that would just be a super useful thing to have in your back pocket for a whole bunch of different use cases. So to wrap this up, I think Blackmagic did an amazing thing by launching the A10 Mini. That really set a new baseline for this kind of gear. Previously, switchers like that have been much more expensive. They managed to bring the price down and there are so many similar devices on the market now, it's really great to see it. When they launched the ATEM Mini Extreme, they did it again. They actually even undercut some of their own more expensive hardware with it because frankly, it can do so much cool stuff. So I am just really excited to see what's next because I feel like if they were able to pull that off last year, there's gonna be some pretty cool stuff coming. And with that, I do wanna say thanks to Blackmagic for loaning me the ATEM Mini Extreme as well as the Pocket 6K camera. I appreciate being able to use these on my live streams over the last few months. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos like this, as well as join me on my next live stream where we will talk more about ATEM switchers as well as all sorts of other live streaming gear. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.